The New England Blister Rust Control Program was dedicated to preserving white pine by eradicating all ribes plants. Gooseberries and currants were an alternate host of the white pine blister rust that had devastated white pine stands for decades. The program ran from the early 1900s until almost 1970 in most states. Crew leaders in New Hampshire created blister rust maps from the field to document where the ribes plants were removed. How was the program structured in New England? What eradication methods were used? How often was a location revisited? How was the program received by the landowners? And who paid for it? In order to learn about the region's blister rust control program, I interviewed two men who experienced it firsthand, Mike Johnson and Rick Mackin. Mike grew up on a small farm in New Hampshire in the 1950s. He was 12 years old when the blister rust control program came to town. Rick grew up in northern Vermont in the 1960s. He spent high school summers working for the blister rust control program. Through the memories of Mike and Rick, you will experience the blister rust control program through the eyes of an adolescent male. As I sat with Mike in his chestnut lined living room on land cleared by his ancestors, we visited the year 1951. What the hell is blister rust all the old timers? <laughs> they didn't know what it was. They could see it was killing some of their trees. Mike, spending most of his time on the farm or at school, didn't know much about the blister rust control program until one spring day. Not till a big yellow wooden sided station wagon rolled into the doyad one day. <laughs> and this guy that looked like a ranger got out and told us that they were here to eradicate the uh, gooseberry bushes and currants. New Hampshire Bureau of Forest or something inside of the rig. And this guy that looked like a ranger and some nice looking college girl. Like, still remember, I think there were four of them. So I went out to help them pull bushes right away. <laughs> Yeah, I think they were trainees, you know, they were involved in forestry is what I think it was. They were getting instructions all the time. Mike remembered exactly where the gooseberries and currants had been hiding on the farm. The road down here by the edge of the road as you come in, there was a lot of them there. We pulled up tons of them in that stretch. They didn't spray or anything. It was all manual labor, yanking them up. The guy would uh, just point them out, we'd yank them up. We'd hang them in the crotch of a tree about waist high so they wouldn't ever sprout again. He had a little clipboard with him, you know, and the whole bit. And uh, I suppose he estimated how many plants we pull up in an area. Along the road there, there was big uh, six, eight inch diameter bundles of them. I mean, the bundles would be just all the stems. And I bet if you look along there, you'll find where they were in the crotch of a tree. There's still a scar where the bushes were hung and made of scars that they grew around them. Of course, they're long gone. All I did was tag along, but <laughs> I pulled up a lot of bushes <laughs> When we get up here by the stream coming down off the hill there with some big pools, we found a few and the guy threw them in the pool. Threw the plants into the pool, just left them in the rook. He said they die very quickly in water and rot, so just throw them into that pool. <laughs> I remember throwing a bundle into one of the pools there at the end of the field. They'll rot away. And uh, I've never seen many since. They did a good job. I asked Mike about the health of the pine trees on the farm. Had the crew leader found any blister rust? We didn't have very much. We had some, but very little, not compared to other places. They, everybody had begun to realize that something was wrong with the trees in places. Everybody was happy to protect the pines. Pines were worth more than it is today. <laughs> I was curious about what happened to all of the white pine trees that had the blister rust disease. Mike recalled, I remember my parents sold some to the lane company here to make buckets. They cut the blister rust trees out here and there. We never had a lot of it here anyway, just spotty. It probably did cut it down and get rid of the currents. And they sold the big Mr. Russ Pine for logs, so I remember getting them out with a team of horses up here. The lane company would come in with a team and cut them, and a couple of old guys chewing tobacco would cut the trees, and they'd load them on the scoops and scoot them down. And chain chainsaws yeah. in. Yeah. Man killers, they were so heavy, they were always getting a cut with them. <laughs> My old relatives drove team for lanes, and being Irish, he's he sang Irish ballads in this big outdoor voice. You'd hear him coming off the mountain with a load of logs singing. The Gypsy Rover and the old team would be nodding their heads and talk deep to his side with singing. It was the Gypsy came over the hill down to the valley so shady. Pine being their bread and butter, 
the lanes went around and eradicated whatever they could have cut, you know, most of the rest trees. And that made a big difference too. They owned a lot of, huge amount of land up on top and they cut out the blister rust trees and of course that helped. But they were glad to save the pine trees. In those days, half the town worked for the lane company making buckets. They had two mills here. and All the farmers sold their pine to them to make buckets. Very few people even know you could eat gooseberries so they didn't dare you pull them up. In fact, I've had old timers tell me, the Yankees tell me they were poison. They were striping berries to kill you. <laughs> they didn't have any idea you could eat them. When asked if his mother used the gooseberries that grew on the farm, Mike quickly replied, My grandmother did, used to pick them. As I remember, she stewed them like you do uh, cranberries. And plus, we eat them raw, too. In a bowl, we'd eat them. They were, they were good. I remember they were excellent. She got most of her gooseberries from the farm up across the road. They had a big patch of them by the house they <laughs> cultivated. Nobody, we didn't tell them about that. But I've seen some pretty big ones in the woods up on Activity Mountain and she's got, they look like they were probably old cultivar, big, big berries. My grandfather in Richmond had a patch of currants. They were cultivars, they used to really produce. And these looked a little different, they were smaller. and These were wild swamp currants and his were cultivars. They never told him about the currants at the farm down there. <laughs> they, went, they went and hauled uh, all the currants out of the woods down there too. But they never found the patch up by the house. <laughs> Mike's experience of the blister rust control program as a 12-year-old male? It was fun. I liked the girls. <laughs> that was Mike's only experience with the blister rust control program. The next year, Rick was born. Rick worked for the Vermont program during the summers of 1968 and 1969. A good friend of mine, his brother, had uh, worked for the state of Vermont the year before doing it and he asked me and so I said yeah yeah it's a job in the summer you know here I'm a teenager and I said sure that'd be a great thing and I've always been out in the woods and I said yeah that'd be a great opportunity to just stay out in the woods and do things I enjoy doing so that's kind of how I got into it I met with uh, the, kind of the program leader who was I mentioned his name before Hollis Pryor he was a pest control specialist uh, out of uh, St. John's very office in Vermont and I went and talked to him, and he said, "Sure, we'll uh, we'll put you on." And he gave us some, uh, gave me some manuals to study, so I could identify the rye beet species because I didn't have a clue what they were either at the time. So you know, I'm, I was I think 16 or something. So did that and studied it, and I don't think we had a test. He said, "Okay, you're good." So we started sometime right after school ended in the summer. So he he went with us, I think, a couple of times. And, showed us, you know, what it was and how we were supposed to do it. And we had to keep track of how many we counted and where we found them. And he supplied us with uh, aerial photographs, old ones, old black and white ones that showed stone walls, um, swamps, where we could go. You know, that's, and that's the areas we were supposed to look at. Rick's job, which involved spraying the ribe shrubs, took him to several towns in Vermont. Okay, they were in the, predominantly in the Connecticut River Valley. We worked in Rygate, Barnett, Waterford, Concord, maybe a little south, maybe in Fairley. Like I said, they're all in the Connecticut River Valley. How the process kind of worked was that in sometime during the, the winter, members of the state forest and parks would meet with towns and they would try to get money appropriated and voted on a town meeting for us to come in and spray and get rid of uh, the blister rust, you know, the ribes in, in uh, their town. As far as I can remember, that's how it worked. The towns actually paid the state to have us do it. If I recall correctly, it was uh, like Agent Orange, uh, 245 T or D and mixed with kerosene. I'm assuming now that we'd probably get a whole lot more hazardous uh, chemical handling training than we did back then. It was kind of stored in the front of the Volkswagen that we, one of my friends had. I can't remember, probably making minimum wage, which back then was probably, you know, a buck something an hour. I don't know, it wasn't much, but it was, you know, enough to keep teenagers happy. So, you know, when gas wasn't very expensive, it was just, you know, they were eight, probably 10 hour days, whatever. And, you know, you did it, except if it was, you know, pouring rain, we didn't do it. I would get up, we'd meet at the office, which is in the post office building in St. Johnsbury, get our directions for the day, or he'd give us 
uh, the photographs or whatever, and we'd head out. The uh, old farmland, like I said, that, that part of Vermont it was all old farms. You get off the road someplace, okay, here's the stone wall he had marked here, and you know, there's some pine here, and let's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go this way, you go that way, and we'll just, uh, you know, start walking up and seeing what we found. If we saw some, we'd spray them and uh, tally them and just keep going until we get to the end of that block, move on to the next one, or the stone walls he marked had pine in the area, very close to the area. It wasn't just a pick a stone wall and go, it was a, a stone wall or a fence or a swamp that had pine associated with it, very nearby. I was curious about how Rick's workday was different than what Mike had experienced. Uh, I was pretty familiar with the woods and stuff, so I might be by myself. And I can remember getting into some areas, and I think it was in Concord, I can remember one, it was a place that I knew fairly well, and I used to hunt in there and stuff as a kid, and the place was, I mean, loaded with them. It was around a swamp, and there was just, uh, there were hundreds of them. I can recall uh, spraying some beside a road one day. It was on a little fence line that ran just south of a farmhouse. And I remember spraying them one day and going back like two days later, and they were all brown. It didn't take long. And one interesting thing we did, I'll, I'll tell you about this little story. There's two of us, and I think we were in Waterford, just below a quaint little village on Route 18, right by the Canadian called White Village. We got a map, and we were, it was an old farm country. It had, it had some big pines in it stone walls and had some old quarries up in the back and uh, we saw something sitting on the stone walls a box well, it's, 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 man, we're poking it we're trying to look at it and stuff and see what it was and then we had some leaves and needles on so we kind of brushed the top off and we looked it was an old box of dynamite so we decided we knew enough I mean we weren't very smart but we were new enough that we probably shouldn't start messing with this stuff we kind of backed out and uh finish what we had to do, but we marked that and told our boss about it. In fact, I think we actually went even down, and there was a farmhouse there, and we, the, the folks that owned the land, we mentioned it, and they said, yeah, there's probably somebody left it there, and they either blasting stumps in the fields, I mean, like I said, these are all little fields at the time, or in the quarries, and somebody had just left it there and stuff, so that was probably the most, could have been the most serious problem if we'd, you know, poked around and, you know, thrown rocks at it or something that might have uh, caused us some real heartache, but <laughs> it, it didn't. What did Rick do if he saw pine trees with blister rust? We put it in the, with whatever little reports, forms we use, and I really can't remember even what they looked like, but it was, you know, we might mention it, you know, that you know, some of the pines looked bad, they were, you know, yellowing off or whatever and stuff, and it probably wasn't a big part of it, we were just out there to kill plants. I can't even remember having a run-in with a homeowner or something if we were walking by the house with a spray can spraying the gooseberries or currants or whatever. They just, it uh, wasn't an issue with them. But as far as the identification, uh, it was just, we were, we told them who we worked for. So if you were doing something to protect their land or their, their resource, their pine, they appreciate it. What did Rick like best about his work with the program? Oh, just finding, you know, nice swimming holes, you know, a hot, steamy day, and you're, uh, you just say, boy, it looks pretty inviting, so, you know, jump in and good times. Good times and good memories from both Mike and Rick, two teen boys experiencing the Blister Rust Control Program from two different perspectives. While Mike helped the college girls pull the gooseberries and currants on his farm in New Hampshire, Rick and his high school friends sprayed the gooseberries that grew along the stone walls in Vermont. They worked directly across the Connecticut River from one of New Hampshire's largest and oldest blister rust infections, covering more than 72 square miles. The blister rust control program had an effect on these teenage boys, one who became a farmer and the other a forester. Despite the heat and humidity, swamps, ticks, mosquitoes, thorns, wildlife, and even dynamite, these teens, now in their 60s and 70s, enjoyed their participation in the Blister Rust Control Program. The memories of Mike Johnson and Rick Mackin were recorded, transcribed, and edited by Janine Marr. Personal accounts of the New Hampshire and Vermont Blister Rust Control Programs, 1951 to 1969, was written by Janine Marr, copyright 2015, all rights reserved.